Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that explores different areas of moving image and audio-based production with me, Paula Blair. I'm delighted to be speaking this time with John Badger of Mercury Theatre Podcast, an audio drama anthology of stories written and directed by John. We'll be talking about those aspects as well as sound design and working with voice actors as well as the storytelling process for 30 minute standalone dramas across different genres. Huge thanks to our listeners and our marvellous patrons over at patreon.com forward slash AV cultures. If you would like to see the full video recording of my chat with John, sign up to our behind the scenes tier. Your support means I can make continual improvements to the show and it gives me such a boost knowing the work is being acknowledged and valued and appreciated. Another way to help is sharing this episode with your friends and boosting us a bit on social media. Thank you so much and enjoy this episode. John Badger, it is great to meet you. I'm really looking forward to learning more about Mercury Theatre podcast. But first of all, a very warm welcome to Audiovisual Cultures. I feel the heat from here, even though we have the the snow coming (laughs) tonight. (laughs) It is is nice to be warmly welcomed. I appreciate it. Oh, that's nice. Could I ask, John, how are you today and whereabouts are you? I am fantastic, and partially because I live in North Carolina in the United States of America. We seceded, we won, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a it's a beautiful location. Like I'm in the the Blue Ridge Mountains, so I get the mm. the view of the mountains, and we're about to get snow, like I said, and it's just. I really like it. I've lived all over the U.S. and I finally mm. found somewhere that I can call home. Oh, that's so nice to hear. That's lovely. Oh, that's a nice way to start. I've interviewed a few audio drama producers before and it's something I'm really enjoying learning a lot more about. So it's really great to have you on. You know, I've been learning a lot about the processes of writing audio dramas and Mm -hmm. the processes of directing them. And uh, in particular, I've been really enjoying expanding my knowledge on sound design. I think that's a really fascinating part of this. I've got a background in film studies and film analysis, and that's the per relation in that subject area is sound design. Mm -hmm. So focusing on audio drama is such a lovely way of learning much more about it. You know, so that's something I'd, I'd love to get into with you later. But could I just firstly ask you to give us an overview, give us some details about Mercury Theory theater podcast and your work making it absolutely it's one of one of my favorite topics of all time so i i'm not not shy mercury theater podcast is an anthological audio drama so anthology meaning that every episode in and of itself is a story so you're no matter where you start listening in mercury theater podcast you can start one that i made last month or one that i made last year and you're going to get just as much out of it as anybody else would because the story is depending on the episode it might be 30 minutes long and you start the story at the beginning of the episode and the the story ends ends at the end of the episode. Mm. But Mercury Theater Podcast is completely done by us. And the only exception is I get I get my sound effects from online for the most mm-hmm. part, but I just got myself a microphone so that I can make some of the mm. some of the Foley artistry and mm-hmm. I can do that on my own. And it's a nice shotgun mic. Mm. I get so ecstatic about some of the, the equipment <laughs> that we but Uh, Mercury Theater Podcast is completely done remotely in that I'll be over here and we'll meet on Discord and we'll Mm. watch the, the other actors and we'll record ourselves individually and we'll go through the episode. So we'll spend a couple hours recording an episode. And because we're on Discord and we're able to record in real time, that makes it so it's a much better final product because most of acting is reacting. Mm -hmm. And with a way that a lot of audio dramas are created, they're not done as much 
in response, they're just reading their lines and mm -hmm. then they're sending in all of their lines and then somebody has to chop it up and then make it so it, mm -hmm. it's cohesive as much as possible. You know, one might have more of a rote read and then another one might have more of a, an emphatic read. So you're mm -hmm. having these different conversations that... Yes, they work on paper, but they don't actually work in feeling like it's a, a conversation. So with Discord, it makes it so that I'm able to have everybody react to one another. And it makes for a much better final product if if I don't say so myself. Mm -hmm. They're pretty crisp, I have to say. I've been listening and the sound is really crisp. Uh, you've got different points of audition, you've got movements coming through, you've got different locations, changing locations while people are moving through spaces and having conversations. You can really pick that up really well. So yeah, yeah it's definitely thanks. paying off. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned television or movies and mm -hmm. the sound design of, of that. It's very much the same process, but as an audio drama, the listener only has the ability to base it off of dialogue and sound effects, and there is no visual component. And that has some drawbacks, but at the same time, it gives a lot more freedom on my end and on the listener's end. I've been finding this to be a pretty consistent thing with books, for instance. So you might read the Harry Potter books, or you might read the Lord of the Rings books, or any book, and then you watch the movie adaptation of that, what you read. And once it goes on television, on the screen, then it confines what your imagination has, because you see it, you hear it. And, you know, at that point, really only you can just imagine what it smells like, I guess, at that point. But with audio drama, you don't have to worry about so much the the visual element because the listener gets to design what that circumstance looks like. Mm. So their imagination takes another step that they would be able to in a book, but they have the sound design that helps them get drawn into this circumstance, but they can build whatever else elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the lovely thing as well is you can decide what people look like because I think with film and television, for example, diversity can be a big issue and uh, inclusivity and when it's voices and it's sound effects you can imagine more what way you want yes. people to look for example yes so i'm actually in the process of auditioning for another series that i'm making but in the process i'm realizing these people have faces right but they only have faces to me as somebody who's working with them. Now, the listener will be able to ultimately listen to the the series and they can figure out whether she has blonde hair or, you know, if she has hair at all. There are all these different elements that people can design for themselves. But with working with social media, I'm finding that it's requiring me to get some of that visual element, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll have the series but I'll also promote the actors themselves. Mm -hmm. So that might be a little bit uh, disheartening. <laughs> it might be disheartening <laughs> because, I mean, how many podcasts do you listen to and you just assume what they look like or, or a radio show? I don't know if you've ever heard the, the show Prairie Home Companion, but that was a show that was on NPR all the time, only like every mm -hmm. uh, Saturday night, right? And I'd listen to it and I create a mental image of what the main actor, Garrison Keillor, looks like. And then I saw a book that he had written and I saw the cover photo and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was incredibly disappointed. That's the first, like, that was the glass shattering moment for me. Okay. And I was like, uh, but it didn't remove that magic of what they are accomplishing. It just put a, an obstacle there. Was it more, you didn't expect that face to go with that voice or something like yes. that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, and if I spent a couple of years listening to him mm. and I didn't have a face to okay. like a, an actual picture, then it's, it's different. But yeah, you do the same with a bunch of voice actors or with other podcasts and then you realize what they look like, then it kind of <laughs> breaks that, that image for you, but you can go back to imagining whatever the, it is that you wanted them to look like, especially mm -hmm. as voice actors, because they are after all acting. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned it's an anthology series. So every story is different. I mean, do you find that a real challenge writing a different 
different type of story every time? No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, go for it. So I, love, the, I want to hear all about this. The, <laughs> there are benefits to writing an anthology in that if I just feel like writing something, if I just come up with an idea, I can make it into an audio drama and I don't have to worry about it lasting a whole season or multiple seasons. I can write something and it be 30 pages long. And then once that's done, it's done. So mm -hmm. I can have this whole whole process of, of going through the wanting to make something to making it, putting out there and then going back to something else. Mm -hmm. And if I looked at all of, I probably have 10 different episodes that are in the works mm -hmm. of being written right now, but I might come up with an idea tonight and then write an entire episode before I put any of those other 10 out. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that I can do whenever I want to. But the drawbacks, there are drawbacks to writing an anthology in that the listener can get engaged with the storyline for the 30 minutes of an episode, but they don't feel attached to that character or any of those mm. characters, right? So I'm in the process of creating a series that isn't anthological. You can listen to episode mm. one, two, three, four, and five, and on and on. And then every episode, you don't know this, but you're becoming more attached to the characters. Mm -hmm. And then when a character does something that you disagree with, you can be disappointed with that person, right? But with an anthology and only 30 minute, minutes investment, you're not as inclined to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So there are drawbacks to writing an anthology, but it's certainly not the ability or the inability to come up with more stories. I'm not short on content it's just a uh, i'm short on time that's what i'm short on interesting do you think it's ground for experimentation because maybe more so than in traditional text publishing you have a bit of leeway to i suppose make some mistakes or things you realize that things maybe don't work so well and then you can figure out how to you adjust things or tweak things or you think well my strengths lie in this pit this is or the, these are parts where right, I need to hone my skills in these parts, you know, at different aspects of it. You know, do you think that you have that freedom of experimentation a bit more? If I didn't, listeners, don't go back to episode one of Mercury Theatre Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So I've actually been referring to Mercury Theater Podcast as my playground, mm -hmm. and I can do that experimentation. At first, I didn't know what I was doing at all. I really just wanted to get into voice acting, and I figured making a podcast would be an opportunity to do that. And if any listeners have been have listened to Mercury Theater Podcast, they'll know that you probably don't even recognize my voice at all, and it's because mm -hmm. I'm not on, not on there as much. <laughs> and the reason why is because I found that my passions actually were more more in tune with the stuff that I wanted to pawn off on other people, like the directing and the writing and the sound design, all of these things that I got really excited about. And the voice acting is something that, you know, I'll make an appearance every so often. I'm kind of like, I refer to myself as sometimes mm -hmm. the, the Stan Lee of <laughs> okay. audio drama in that, <laughs> you know, I'll show up every so often. Yeah, the experimentation is something that if it wasn't for experimentation, I certainly wouldn't be where I am now mm -hmm. and working on a series as well. And because I've been able to experiment with Mercury Theater Podcast, I can find out what my capacity is, what I can and cannot do. Now I can put this into an audio drama series and have have it so that you're not going to have a really big difference between episode one and episode three, which with Mercury Theater Podcast, you would be able to notice the night and day difference between episode one and episode three. Mm. But between the episodes like 10 and 13, there isn't as much of a, of a jump. Because I'm down, I'm now to the point where I can hone my skills. You mentioned there that because you try and keep them quite tight to 30 minutes and they're different story every time, there's not necessarily that much space to flesh out your characters. Is that something you work on with the voice actors? 
is, you know, you, you write what needs to happen for your plot and do they help you flesh out the characterizations a bit more? You know, how does that work for you? The characters aren't incredibly fleshed out, but with the episodes that have fewer characters, you can get to understand their reasoning more. So I have an episode that I'm recording tomorrow that it's just two people. And those two people, you get to understand where they stand with their perspectives, right? Mm. And there's an episode, one that I actually am I'm still very proud of. One of the first ones that I was really proud of was DEN for Denver International Airport. Mm. And that was a really fun one. And the reason why, one of the reasons why is because there are essentially two characters. And one leads the other one and explains a bunch of stuff and you get to understand what what's going on. So with the voice actors, we'll do essentially a cold read and get to find out what their characters are doing, what they're trying to accomplish. But I don't go so far as to say, okay, this is who your character is. Mm -hmm. This is your motivation. Not all the time. So now there are certain times when I will say for a certain scene, okay, so your character is being elusive. So mm. be elusive, but at the same time, like telling whatever, mm -hmm. right? So it's scene by scene at that point, but with the series, and this is one of the most exciting parts about making the other series is that we'll go through the entire first season and everybody will understand who their character is and what their goal is. And, you know, they'll have those character arcs that I, I, don't have the ability to with the anthology. If you're enjoying the show and would like more information straight to your inbox, head over to audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com linked in the show notes and sign up to our mailing list. I was uh, wondering as well about genre because from the episodes I've listened to and then scrolling down through a lot of them, you're touching on a lot of different genres. I think, you know, there's some crime, there's mystery, there's maybe thriller, there's historical drama, you know, there's lots of different kinds of stories right. being yeah. told. Is it again, an exploration of what you, what are the possibilities of genre and what you can accomplish in that in 30 minutes? You know, what, how do you feel about that? So for me, I really enjoy being able to do that because okay. it's it is whatever it is that I I want to do mm -hmm. at, the, at the present time but with you know a lot of anthologies they'll stay thematic right mm -hmm. so they might have a horror theme mm -hmm. so all of the stories are different but they still fall in that horror aspect the same with with any theme for an anthology but with Mercury Theater podcast it's just completely different every time and some listeners might not love an episode, right? But they'll mm. be able to skip off to the next episode and really enjoy that episode. Now, for me, I'm just writing whatever comes to my mind, right? So I'm using this again as my playground and getting familiar with the process, but at the same time, also figuring out what it is that I enjoy writing. And I do have like, um, very old time radio investigation kind of mm -hmm. episodes or some, you know, like you said, there are all these different themes, but I'm finding that I enjoy a certain type of writing, but at the same time, I'm not held to mm -hmm. like, I, you can't put Mercury theater podcast in a box. That's one of the things that I like about it. But at the same time, I know that there are probably listeners who listen to the episodes and not knowing what they're going to get, they find that they're not as inclined to listen to the next episode. I mean, at the end of the day, it's my podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is the bottom line of indie podcasting is I can do whatever I want. That's the point of this. <laughs> Yeah, that's really, really interesting because I don't know how much freedom writers who are maybe in more industrial settings in terms of writing for media in some way. So for television, for example, they're maybe just hired and they have to do what they have to do. Um, So it's really, really interesting that you've got that freedom to make those decisions, but also it's the creative impulse, really, I think is what you're exploring as well. Right. And also from the from the sound designer perspective, mm. I'm actually giving myself an extra challenge as opposed to making it thematic. 
say for instance, a television show. So um, have you seen the show House? No, but I know of it. Okay. And, and I just picked House out of the... It has mm -hmm. n no reason. There is, for instance, they have their set, right? At the studio, they have their set, and then they can go... There are several different levels to the set, but how much it costs to actually produce it is much lower because they only have to work within that set, right? Mm. Now, every so often they'll go off location and then go do something else, but that's very far and few between. But with, you know, to a, a much smaller extent with sound design. So with sound design, I have to create a scene, right, for the listener. So I might have like birds chirping in this outdoor setting, but I might also have another setting where there's a vacuum cleaner running right mm -hmm. and i have all these different sound effects but if i had a series then i don't have to work so much on the bird sound effects i can just work on the vacuum cleaner sound effects because every so often you're going to run into that vacuum cleaner and like as you're going through and i'm just again pulling things out of the hat mm -hmm. but that sound design is much much more freeing with mercury theater podcast but it's also something that you have to do a lot more investigation to get those sound effects and everything mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I'm excited and I'm also bummed about mm. with Universe 25, the upcoming series, is that I can have some consistency and I don't have to draw from all of these different places for all of these sound effects. It's going to be something that there's going to be this, it's thematic. Mm -hmm. I know I totally just rambled there, but... <laughs> no, I know it was great because um, that's the sort of thing I'm really hoping to learn about actually. You know, because when you're when you're saying that, I think especially with the location changes, because I listened to your most recent episode and it's a bit of a murder mystery. And, um, you know, there are investigators. So there's a scene where two investigators, I think, are uh, having a conversation as they walk through a corridor. So it's quite echoey and there's echoey footsteps. And then they enter the office of another character and then suddenly the sound is much more soft and there's mm -hmm. no echo anymore, you know? So it's small things like that help you imagine the setting and help you visualize right. the kind of location, you know, and you're, you're not doing very clunky dialogue of going, well, we'll just go into this room now, shall we? And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're letting the sound effects do that for you, which is a very show, don't tell thing in cinema as well. So it's a very listen, don't tell thing is what you're doing in your sound design. I love that show, don't tell. I'm, I know that that's, that you didn't just make that up, but that's <laughs> so, so very much what I do. I, if you listen to the audio dramas of yesteryear, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I know that in the UK they have, they've consistently had like BBC Four mm -hmm. has been the audio dramas, right? And you guys never stopped, which is <laughs> yeah. kind of jealous of that. But with audio dramas, there are a lot that say, oh, he has a gun. Or there's one, I think it's from the show um, Have Gun Will Travel, which is mm -hmm. one of those really old shows. Mm -hmm. But they're supposedly in the scene, there are people in a car and they're being haunted by some woman, right? Or like chased by some woman. Then one guy says, her hair, her face. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> When is that ever going to be dialogue like in real life? Like when's mm -hmm. anybody going to say that? And I try to make sure that everything that is said in Mercury Theater podcast is stuff that's likely to actually be said. Sometimes in that same episode, there's like, for instance, the uh, one of the girls vapes, right? Mm -hmm. And you hear it, but then he refers to like, don't vape around me, right? This is stuff like there's the audio cue, but there's also that dialogue reinforcement of mm -hmm. what it is that you just heard. But it's not, hey, I see that vape in your hand. You should probably put that in your pocket. It's mm -hmm. dialogue that I, I intend to make so that it sounds as realistic as possible. There's nothing worse in audio drama than having to like having to get yourself re-engaged to audio drama that because they're saying stuff that just wouldn't actually be said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love as well that you tend to include um, some outtakes as well and some just chatter amongst your cast uh, with you, you and your cast in the production process. And it's quite revealing, but it's also quite fun. You, know, why, why do you include those? Well, going back a little bit in the couple minutes mm -hmm. of, of that is that there is at the end of in the credits, right? All of the people say their own name and their character. 
and you get to hear what their voice actually sounds like because sometimes they'll do something that that is totally different mm -hmm. than their actual voice. And it's far and few between, but it is fun to listen to. So going back to the episode DEN, that one, there is a voice actor, Angelo Cruz, who mm -hmm. has an amazing voice. What an amazing voice. He plays the role of probably somebody a middle-aged man. Mm -hmm. He's 21 when oh, he's wow. in the episode, but he has such a deep, very crisp vocal. It sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. But when he says, as so-and-so, I'm Angelo Cruz. And then you hear what they actually sound like, right? Mm. Then going into outtakes, the reason why I did that was actually partially because, one, I wanted people to know what they sounded like, but also it's an homage to the show Let's Pretend. Okay. That was also an anthology back in the day. I listened to that as a kid. Absolutely loved that. Mm. And they would say, I, I always remember Sybil Trend was one of the, the consistent voice actors on there. So they would say their, their name. But with the outtakes, I enjoy outtakes and I just find highlights within that. And I'm already having to work with those outtakes regardless. So I figured mm -hmm. I just put them at the back of this the episode and then find my favorite ones and then put those in there. The favorite ones that I can put on there. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> because... Uh, Mercury Theater Podcast is actually designed to be listened to by children in addition to their parents. I say that it's it's written or created for adults and then edited with kids in mind, right? Mm -hmm. I found that family friendly usually means that it's for the kids, but mm -hmm. parents might find something that might be enjoyable about it. And I kind of went the other way around mm -hmm. and made it so that kids can listen to it and not be offended, but it's really to get the adults happy about it. Okay. And then there's some people who just don't like swearing yeah. and a lot of stuff they rely heavily on swearing as the way that they put out stuff. But mm -hmm. I, I don't like to do that. Not with mm -hmm. that one. Universe 25 is going to be a little bit different in that regard. It's going to be much more adult centered. So Universe 25, what might people be able to expect from that? What are you planning for that one then? Ooh. Can you tell us yet? <laughs> what, can you reveal what anything I can yet? Tell. <laughs> there are some friends who a thousand years in the future, these friends find an artifact that was from a thousand years prior, which if you do the math, it's about right about now <laughs> <laughs> that, that it was, it was left, but they find that it goes against what they have come to understand as reality. Mm. And they use this artifact and try to spread the information that the artifact represents. That's kind of the jumping off point. It's going to be a lot of fun. Some people think of it as probably science fiction, but it's not really meant to be science fiction. It's kind of just, I've been trying to put some what it's like. And I realized that really I can't find a whole lot of stuff that it's very much like. Mm -hmm. Now, like Fahrenheit 451 is a book okay. that I've been told might have some similarities. Mm -hmm. And there are some other... Oh, have you ever seen Breaking Bad? Oh, okay. Right, yeah. It'll have some Breaking Bad element to it, mm -hmm. but in that you're getting attached to the characters, right? And then you're wondering at what point do they devolve mm -hmm. into... Would you stop being their friend, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of emotional investment that I'm I'm hoping to accomplish with this, but at the same time, you know, asking questions that people are dealing with today and I'll have to leave it at that. There's just so much that that's going on with it. I'm mm -hmm. so excited about it, but I don't really know how to I haven't actually tried to put it into words in a sure. concise elevator pitch what it is, sure. but I don't have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you have an idea when you'll be able to release that one then? So we're in the casting process right now. Sure. And because it's going to be a lot easier to actually create the sound design, it'll be a lot faster of a process. But at the same time, I'll still be putting out Mercury Theater podcast and have to record it plan on doing all of the recording next month, but mm -hmm. with the snowstorm, it might actually put us into March and it'll probably be out in May, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. but don't hold me to it. It could come out in August or sure. November or something. <laughs> Well, when it, whenever it's ready, we can retweet, we can boost, whatever. <laughs> That'd be great. I, I love all of that. 
Brilliant. Well, good luck with the production of it. It sounds intriguing. <laughs> Thanks. If nothing else, it will be intriguing. I'm loving the writing of it, mm. partially because it is a series, right? And I can go from episode one, that'll be pretty mild, mm. and then it accelerates as the series goes on. Mm. But at the same time, I can write stuff and I can write theory into stuff that happened or will happen with the environment, with the characters. And there's stuff that still, I wrote something a couple of days ago and and I was like, that would be amazing, mm. you know, because I've already written it. But I realized that there's stuff that has the potential of being before all of it even starts that would completely change the environment that's going on. So I kind of accidentally blow my own mind. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe the listener won't be as excited when they find out about it, but... You know, for me as a as a writer, it's so mm -hmm. fun to be able to excite myself and to find find stuff that's still still really interesting. Mm -hmm. And with Mercury Theater podcast, it's only thirty minutes. And now, granted, if you look at the thirty minute episode of Mercury Theater podcast, and sometimes it's like twenty three minutes or whatever. For each minute of final product, you're looking at about a page of dialogue. But with with a screenplay for a movie, it's actually going to be kind of the same. But most of the only like, probably half of the writing is actually into explanation as to mm -hmm. like screen, like where the camera is, like it's panning over the cityscape or whatever. I don't have that ability as an audio drama creator. So if you actually put the dialogue of my episode to the dialogue of a movie, it's it's certainly not one to one. It's mm -hmm. much higher. It'd be much closer to like a probably a 50 minute creation as far as dialogue to like if it was a movie, it would be about the equivalence mm -hmm. of 50 minutes. But it's something that I found interesting when I was I don't know if you ever do this, but if you look at the screenplay of a movie as you're watching the movie and like reading along with the dialogue mm -hmm. and seeing mm -hmm. all of the stuff. I was surprised at how short those were. And I have now written with Universe 25, something that's longer than this. It's actually going to be probably two and a half hours of season one. Mm. That's a fun thing to be able to look at before I actually put people in front of a microphone. <laughs> something to look forward to then on the audio, audio drama sphere. <laughs> Well, and, and Mercury Theater Podcast. It's a monthly of episode, course. so uh, keep course. on listening to that. <laughs> yeah, of course. I do enjoy the variety of that, I have to say, really getting into the different stories. I was just thinking as you were, were talking there as well that, you know, you mentioned that you record everything remotely. So, I mean, that has worked out fairly well over the past couple of years, I'm guessing. Was this something you started during this um, strange time that we've been in for the past couple of years, or was this something you were doing before? I did actually start this during COVID. So I was actually, my my wife was on, was on holiday, as you would say, and she was across the country visiting family and I was bored and mm -hmm. I figured I could just redesign my, uh, my spare bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> So I did that and she came home and she was not happy. Oh, no. <laughs> but I'm like, nobody's ever in here. But I wouldn't be for a while, for sure. Well, yeah, certainly, <laughs> certainly not for a while. So I made it so there was a soundproofed area so that I'd be able to do nice. recordings. That's not where I am right now, mm -hmm. but it's it's over there. I should probably be more respectful of people every so often um, and do that. Yeah, so I did that. But with with the other voice actors, most of them actually are in theater and mm -hmm. they were kind of missing the that theater mm -hmm. experience. So I kind of unintentionally made myself a conduit that people could actually find themselves doing something that they enjoy doing. And it's a lot of fun to actually make an episode of Mercury mm -hmm. Theater podcast. But, you know, that's one of the things that I'm going to be changing with Universe 25 is that mm -hmm. I'll actually have that one and that one will be in person as opposed to being virtual. And that's going to be I'm so excited about that process because it'll be more of the same. But at the same time, it's something that's different and people can respond to each other's like visual element, even though the listener isn't going to see that visual. They're mm -hmm. going to hear 
there's more excitement when people are standing up in front of a microphone as opposed to sitting down in front of a microphone. And to break that glass, people might have. So Mercury Theater Podcast is mostly acted sitting down. And I want people to get like physical, right? Mm -hmm. So instead mm -hmm. of a running scene that sounds like this, they'll actually get involved and they'll yeah. like run in place without lifting their feet, if that doesn't <laughs> confuse you too much. That physical element is going to put it to a, um, yet another level. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, so Mercury Theater Podcast has been, I don't know if you're familiar with the Audioverse Awards, but a bunch of audio dramas will submit an episode mm -hmm. of theirs to Audioverse Awards, and then they mm -hmm. will, they'll judge it, right? Mm -hmm. There were over 1,700 applicants for mm -hmm. this year in Audioverse Awards, and we actually got nominated amongst the top 10 for vocal directing. Brilliant. Yeah. And I, again, that goes back to people having somebody to respond to. If you listen to a bunch of audio dramas, you'll realize that the conversation is stilted. And I try to eliminate that as much as possible. But if I can do that with being virtual, how much more so can I do being in person? So I'm mm -hmm. excited about that. And funny thing is, I have no no directing experience whatsoever before mm -hmm. all of this. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'll take it. Yeah. Episode 100 of our podcast was with Bo Lamore and he's a, an audio drama producer out in LA oh, and yeah. does a lot of directing. I'd recommend to you actually to listen to my chat with him because he talks a lot about exactly what you've just been talking about, uh, working in space with actors so that they're actually standing around in a circle and they're interacting with each other and trying to get performances out of people, actually getting them to embody the performance you actually walk across and then shout something at that guy because it's not coming out with you pretending to do it just actually do it you know and yeah. that sort of stuff so he, he's really useful to listen to he's very very experienced so that man actually should write a book and i've seen a lot of his posts so we're in actually a couple of the same groups on, yeah. on facebook he puts out a lot of information Essentially, the the author of today's audio dramas, Casey Wayland, wrote the book Bombs Always Beep. And that guy is amazing. <laughs> but I actually had the ability to have a conversation with Casey Wayland. Oh. And there's an episode of us talking. It's stuff that being willing to learn and being willing to change your actions accordingly, mm -hmm. because sometimes somebody will get a bad habit and then they'll stick to it. And if somebody is able to say, Hey, you should probably do this, maybe do that. And then if you do that, then you have the potential of growing. Mm -hmm. But the best way to make no progress is by doing the exact same thing that you've been mm -hmm. doing. I've read Bombs Always Beep cover to cover probably three times. It has a bunch of highlighting and a bunch of notes that I've put on yeah. there. I actually need to read it again because I've gotten to a, another level. And it's something that no matter where you are in the production, you can always learn more from it. His book was actually probably an eighth of the size that it probably should be because there's so much more information that could be given. But I can't imagine somebody would want like that handbook being like, mm. oh. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it's really, really good resource. But Bo uh, Lamore should should write one as well. Yeah, really informative. There's a lot of really good, I suppose, advice. You can take it as advice in, in that episode I did with him. And I just, mind just filled with inputs that, <laughs> that day. <laughs> Talking to him <laughs> was great. It would be a lovely thing. It's something if it's, it's never going to happen, I don't think, but it'd be a lovely idea to do if you ever could would be the likes of live recordings. I think with Mercury Theatre, do you know, have you ever maybe thought of that? It's a maybe a far off future thing, you know, where you can have, say, in a pub or something or a room with a bit of an audience, even a small one, and have your actors in the same place. And because I know they're all, all over the place, but just in a, in a dream scenario, you know, it'd be such a fun thing to do be to have like a live audience there with you with your actors that'd be really fun yeah so i mentioned prairie home companion a little bit ago prairie home companion was one of those shows that mm -hmm. i believe they traveled and they would go to different theaters and they would have their performance and every week it was something different but they had some of this definitely some of the same elements and there's one uh 
sketch that they would just they would go back to and it was Guy Noir, Private Eye, right? I really, really enjoyed that because you get the sound effects and everything, like the shoes, the people walking. Mm. There was somebody that was a Foley artist. He had yeah. the shoes in his hands and he was making those walking sound effects. And then you have like the door creaking and all of that stuff. All of that stuff is on stage. And there are these these voice actors who are doing all of this stuff every week. If I could, I absolutely would. <laughs> the problem is there isn't enough time in the day mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. all of the stuff that I want done so an episode of Mercury Theater Podcast, if you go back far enough, mm -hmm. like DEN or Nikki Sketch and those those episodes really early on, those were actually taking me about 120 hours to produce mm -hmm. in sound design. Mm -hmm. That's not even including the acting and the writing. That mm -hmm. was just the sound design. It's a lot of time. Now, as time has progressed, as I've honed my skills, I can now get an episode, a 30 minute episode done in about 30 hours. So if you think about that, that puts me about an hour a minute, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is still kind of a lot. But in addition to that, I'm also doing the Universe 25, which is a, a series. So now tack on another, I think it's going to be about eight episodes. Tack on another eight, eight episodes or that one's uh, 150 pages or something. Yeah, it's 150 mm -hmm. pages. To add on to that, put in the live setting, there is not enough time <laughs> in the world to, to get all that stuff done. But if I had my, what I, I've heard referred to as my druthers, right? If I had my druthers, I would actually get to the point where I, I can pass Mercury Theater podcast on to somebody else mm. and say, this is yours. Take care of it, right? I would still have some say and say, maybe try something different or whatever. But I definitely would see myself having a hands off mm -hmm. thing with that. But fixating on stuff like Universe 25 and potentially going into live I've definitely even scouted out a really small community theater. I was like, hey, that would be a place that if once a month or something that I would have like an audience and have people interacting with the voices, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, nice. Maybe someday. Yes. But <laughs> that, it is, <laughs> yeah. there, is a, there is not enough time in the world. <laughs> no, I know. Just, I'm just, I just had a little meander in my imagination there. <laughs> no, I love it. And this is actually a conversation that I've heard and I've had now uh, on, a, on a few occasions. Mm. And it's because it is a really good idea. Mm. It's just, it's that implementation yeah. and like getting all those elements to work. And currently in this environment, there's fully artistry that I want to do. I want to make mm. it so crowd work. But the problem with crowd work right now in this world mm. is it's hard to do because mm. one, you're either risking people's health mm. or two, you're getting the muffled masking and everything mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, go the step further and go th for a third. And then you have maybe a hundred people in front of a hundred different microphones or one microphone and just have them kind of cycle through. But that's not going to have the same element that a crowd mm -hmm. would. You're getting mm -hmm. just that really small, again, going back to acting and reacting. In a crowd, people are using other people as their mm -hmm. gauge for how excited or how mellow they need to be. If I had a crowd, I would be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But I want to get rid of this whole COVID thing. That'd be nice. And then be able to get people back into a room and not have to worry about masks muffling the sound that they mm -hmm. would be giving otherwise. It occurs to me that I hadn't asked you, is there a significance to Mercury Theater? Oh, I was a really big fan of old time radio. Most of everything that I do at one way or another is an homage to previous endeavors. And Orson Welles, have you ever mm -hmm. heard War of the Worlds, the mm -hmm. audio production? So that was done by Orson Welles, and that was Mercury Theater on air. So okay. he had his theater, which was Mercury Theater, and then they would also do the audio dramas. So it's an homage to Orson Welles and his works. Very nice. Love it. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you were really hoping to talk about? I want to talk about all things audio all drama. Things. I could geek out <laughs> about audio drama forever and ever and ever oh. and still want to go to the next person and still do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I love the whole process, just everything that's involved with it. Oh. 
but no, I think that all of the uh, all of the stuff we went over. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other people's audio dramas that you listen to that you think people should know about? Maybe. Oh my goodness! Yes. I love, okay, <laughs> kind of self-serving, but if you go into Mercury Theater Podcast and go into the, the extra episodes, there mm-hmm. are interviews that I've had with a bunch of audio drama creators. Mm-hmm. I have spoken, like I said, to Casey Wayland. I've spoken to Gabriel Urbina. He created Wolf 359 and Unseen, but the indie audio dramas I'm the most excited about because it's people who are like me who don't have... They're not working with the highest names in mm-hmm. acting, right? So Casey Wayland, he cheats. He's able to work with Lawrence Fishburne and mm. with LeVar Burton and all of these other actors that the indie drama creators aren't able to. But they're putting out stuff that they're extremely passionate about. Mm-hmm. And the first one that comes to mind is The Vanishing Act. And that's amazing. Definitely an adult audience, but fun adult audience that's amazing then the call of the void that's an Mm. audio drama as well and i've spoken to both the producers from both of those Mm. and there are a few more i actually have on my website a list of audio dramas that people should listen to and they are definitely among them but i love audio drama people because Mm. they're excited about being able to put out something that i'm also excited about putting (laughs) out but they have their own unique styles and Mm -hmm. you know with the vanishing act that was done mostly remotely for the second season but for the first season they put or or the second half of the first season they did remotely but they still did it in such a way where it was kind of live Mm. but they have theater backgrounds and then call of the void they actually know the vanishing act people and i did Mm. not know this but they made all of their stuff they did kind of that what i was telling you is stilted in that you know they would have their their dialogue and then somebody else's dialogue and just keep on putting that Mm. but they did it in such a way that they were able to have somebody respond to them Right. Mm-hmm. So they were able mm-hmm. to use the other people's mannerisms so that it, it was all cohesive and all mm-hmm. of these different directing processes that are that are going on right now with COVID being a thing. It's really creative how how people are coming out with content and not losing what they built. OK, great. Just on that then. So those are a few things we can put in the show notes and link to. Do you want to say out your website and any socials Do you want to point people towards? Sure. <laughs> so first and foremost, the website has all of the socials and everything. Mm-hmm. And you can contact me if you wanted to uh, via email that's on there. So me personally, I'm John S. Badger on Twitter, or I am I'm on all the socials. You can find <laughs> Mercury Theater Podcast on Twitter, Facebook. Just It's actually a really big time suck is all the socials. I, I'm sure yeah. you can you, <laughs> you yeah, know all about it. Says, yeah. But <laughs> it's like somebody else will get on there for fun and I'm just on there to to get the word out, let people understand yeah. what it is that I'm I'm doing, but at the same time not being like a salesman, right? It's fun. But yeah, uh, Mercury Theater Podcast dot com. Mercury Theater. Theater spelled either way. I got both of the domains and these. Oh, but okay. It is spelled R E if you were <laughs> wondering about the actual mm. spelling. I did it the right way. <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, very good. Well, John Badger, it has been such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you've got something out of it as well. It's been really great to see your enthusiasm as well coming through. It's been so enjoyable. Yeah, the enthusiasm isn't something that's going away anytime soon. I got into this about a year and a half ago and got really excited about it. And as time has progressed, I've only gotten more excited about it. It's just now I'm figuring out a lot more of the well one people don't like to geek out a whole lot because they're like okay it's a podcast but it's not it's it's an audio drama it's like yeah yeah it's on a whole other level <laughs> podcasts can be pretty great too I have to oh, say. of course of, of <laughs> course there's some pretty good ones like this one this one's a pretty great one 
but yeah, it's putting 30 hours of post-production into it just to add the mm. sound effects and everything. Just take people out of their headspace and put them into a storyline. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. This is exactly the place to come. If you want to geek out about stuff, we love a whole heap of geeking out on audiovisual cultures. So you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It really has been. Thank you.